Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Google for Work Global Marketing Senior Director Chris Farnacci. kick off day two of Atmosphere Tokyo. My name is Chris Farinacci, and uh, I head up global marketing for Google for Work. And this is actually my fifth Atmosphere Tokyo, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's inspiring to see how it's grown to really uh, an experience. Um, so I wanted to just quickly um, set up the day two agenda. So we have an exciting agenda um, in front of you today. Yesterday, we heard from um, Google folks, PwC executives, and from a number of leading Japanese companies and customers, such as Fujitech, Mori Building, JTD, uh, and Misao Kong, about adapting to change, and how technology is growing exponentially, and how technology can help businesses thrive in a digital and sometimes disruptive world. Today, I'm super excited about day two of Atmosphere and the agenda for today. It's really about people. People are the most important part of your business. And when your people, your, your talent, your employees are truly engaged, great things happen. Building a culture of empowerment and inclusion is a critical aspect of driving innovation and, uh, and, and uh, digital transformation in businesses today. So with that as a theme, I wanted to just give you some highlights of what you'll be hearing this morning. Uh, we're pleased to have the Ministry of Economy, Industry, and Trade here to discuss women, technology, and innovation. Uh, Lobus will be here to talk about how HR, human resources, can help facilitate innovation in Japanese companies. Keio University will be here to talk about the role of technology in empowering students and the global student body uh, in developing the skills of the future. Uh, and finally, you'll hear from, from Google on a number of topics, including unconscious bias, and how technology is both the secret ingredient in Google Food, but also uh, a key to transforming communication at work. So it's going to be a great day, and I'd like to kick it off by handing things over to Google's own Kareem Tamsamani. Uh, Kareem is a longtime Googler, uh, vice president and fearless leader of our Asia business. His mission is to help digitize Asia, and he's here to talk to us about uh, how, how uh, you know, our efforts to help digitize Japan. So with that, uh, please give a, uh, a warm round of applause for Karim. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. So how are you it's a real pleasure to be here today in front of so many of our very dear partners. Today I want to talk to you about the world's internet, because the world's internet is really changing. People are leaving their desktops behind and using the internet on all of the devices you're carrying with you today, smartphones. The change that we see is actually far more intense in Asia than it is in the West. Yes, Asia is a global leader in mobile. Asia has five out of the top ten markets when it comes to smartphone adoptions, including countries like Singapore at 88% adoption, Korea and Hong Kong. Japan's smartphone users are a key part of this shift. They are changing the way that they relate to media. They're changing the way they relate to businesses. They're changing the way they are relating to services of all kinds. And Japanese users, as you would know from your own usage, use smartphones for everything. They watch videos, and importantly, they watch much longer videos than in the West. And they shop on their smartphones, far more than in Western countries. You can see that on the data behind me. 
the Japanese consumer is changing how the world's internet is used. And the reality is that Japan changed Google. Yes, Japan changed Google. Japan was the second country in the world where YouTube became more watched on mobile devices than on desktop. Japan was one of the first countries where Google search queries on mobile exceeded Google search queries on desktops. These changes are really of global significance to Google, which also means that Japan uses of technology is also a globally significant opportunity for every single business, for every single one of you here. And of course, this raises two big questions that will shape the future and the survival of nearly every Japan corporation for the next 10 years. First, how can businesses in Japan adapt to those consumers who relate to businesses in completely new ways? And second, how can businesses use that technology as efficiently as consumers? People of any new ages use smartphones to access data and to save money and to save time. Businesses, meaning most of you here in the room, have been very slow, certainly much slower than consumers, to find the same efficiencies. So today, I want to discuss three traditional Japanese businesses. Those businesses have used data, the cloud, and smartphones the same way that Japanese people do, to pursue new abilities and to drive efficiency in their business. How many of you here have heard of Yoshimoto? Please raise your hands. How many have heard of Yoshimoto? Many people here, of course. Laughter and comedy are fundamental instinct that has existed as long as humans have. Yet, even the business of comedy is changing. I expect many of you to know of Yoshimoto because the company started in 1912. Since then, it has focused on promoting the comedians and finding revenues of their laughter. They started at the theater, obviously. But they have adapted to the age of TV, then to the age of DVD. They actually even have an amusement, amusement park. However people want to laugh, Yoshimoto will make them laugh. They used to spend a lot of money sending their videos to, to, of, of the comedians to TV stations all around the country. But now that the smartphone has become a core entertainment device, Yoshimoto really has understood this. They know that Japanese smartphone owners spend more time on their device, on their smartphone device, than they do on their TV. So now, Yoshimoto promotes the comedians on YouTube, which is now watched on smartphones more than on desktops. Something else happened to them. They realized how crucial their email marketing was when the great earthquake unfortunately destroyed their mail server. One of the main tools in promoting their artist, essentially the tool driving their business, was gone. Now they're using Google servers to send out their emails and importantly, to boost their reliability. They still focused as a business on getting people into theaters, as they did in 1912. They still focus to some degree on selling DVDs. They just do it in a totally different way, following Japanese audiences where most people live their lives, next to mobile internet connection. <coughs> and a funny thing really happened to them. Their videos, all on YouTube, 
are now increasingly watched by Japanese people all overseas. When you digitize your business, the internet's global spread becomes clear. A great new opportunity for Yoshimo. Which actually leads me to the next business I'm going to talk to you about. Toto. Toto also dates a long way back. It was founded in 1970. And it's very serious now about expanding outside of Japan. As a foreigner living in Japan, let me tell you, Toto should be a global company. Once you've sat on a warm toilet seat, you don't understand why people would ever want to sit on a cold toilet seat. The cost of global expansion has transformed rapidly for every business over the last five years. First, marketing overseas has fallen dramatically. We see Japanese small and medium businesses exporting traditional Japanese crafts like paper umbrellas to markets in Latin America with better efficiencies than global conglomerates. The second part that is falling in as just as important is the IT infrastructure. The IT infrastructure now can expand at exactly the same rate as your global workforce. That fact was not true 10 years ago. Every new office then required a new server and required new security solutions. So in 2011, Toto started to use Google Apps in all of their Asia Pacific offices. They liked it for security, but also because it was adaptable. And now, the whole company is moving from on-premise server model to using Google Apps because it puts all of their offices on a single scalable system. Your IT infrastructure should not be something that is restraining your international growth. It should actually fuel it. The cloud allows this to happen. Sushiro is the last company and the youngest company on my list. It was founded a little more recently in 1975. It's actually a very exciting business. They've always brought innovation to the tradition of making sushi. In 1992, they actually developed a system to make the rice parts of sushi with a machine. They developed the first IT system to rotate sushis around in, in sushi stores in 2002. But what they're doing today has implications far beyond cooking and should be adapted in many other businesses. What they needed as a business was to ensure quality. For any business, quality really comes down to two things. The skills that you give your staff and how you essentially monitor their work on a day-to-day -day basis. Sushiro decided to digitize both. They wanted to return employees to focus on the best way to make sushi, to slice the fish correctly, to defrost it in the right way. The training video for all of their staff are now completely online which means that they are accessible on any Android, iOS, or PC devices anywhere around the world. An employee at any of the store can check the best way to make something whenever they want. New employees can be shown training videos in any part of their restaurants, right next to the tools that they'll be using to make the sushi. And to check on the quality, they digitize the checklist. From a tablet or a smartphone, you can access any checklist that helps ensure the proper procedures are followed in making sushi. People don't need to print them out anymore. They don't need a mess across the kitchen. 
across every store and in every city, you can be sure that everyone is following the right procedure. And they can actually even quickly change those procedures if they see room for improvement. So you might not be able to digitize sushi, but you can certainly digitize the knowledge to make it. You might not be able to digitize laughter, but you can digitize the way people connect to the comedians. You might not be able to digitize a toilet, but you can digitize how you reach it. In each case, you are making it easier to do the one thing you wanted to do in the first place. Information technology shouldn't be a goal. In the end, all the technology fails if it doesn't make people's roles and people's lives easier. Businesses, all of you in this room, should be using the technology in the exact same way our consumers do. The first step in the digitization process is to digitize as many parts of your business as you can so that all of your teams can use it efficiently. Thank you. In the end, people are at the core of the company. The tech is just here to help. And that's why the next topic is really important to me. When I say people, I actually should say every person, not just men. Last year, you might have seen that Google published its numbers on how many women we hire in every one of our sites. We were the first company in the Silicon Valley to do so. Tech companies, in reality, wanted to keep a lot of these numbers quiet. Because, frankly, the numbers are not that great. We believe that we cannot improve things if we don't allow us to discuss them openly. The percentage of women working at Google overall is growing. So I'd like to invite Miki Iwamura to discuss some of the small steps that we think will help Japan's workforce in the future. Tech obviously has a small part to play here, although obviously the real change and real innovation will come from a broader conversation, which I hope we all have together. Thank you.